They are among the oldest flowering plants on Earth. They outlived the dinosaurs and may outlive us. There's more than 25,000 species. But what is it about orchids that inflames human passions? Nothing in science can account for the way people feel about orchids. Orchids arouse passion more than romance. They are the sexiest flowers on Earth. What is the mystery behind the orchid's power of seduction? Over the last three centuries, dozens of people have died while hunting them. And this man came within an inch of joining them. I went into Central America, my friend Paul, looking for orchids and looking for a whole array of plants. While in the jungles of Colombia, he and his friend were kidnapped by terrorists. It was like I've never been on death row. Track record in the past, if there's no ransom, and that's the end of you, isn't it? Then, after nine months of captivity, Christmas arrived a few days early as the former hostages were reunited with their families. Two had been there. searching for rare orchids in a particularly dangerous area of jungle between Colombia and Panama. Hostage taking is practically an industry here. It was scary, it was hilarious, it was things I never felt before. Now, safely home on his family's estate in England, you would think he's had enough botanical adventure. But only 14 months since his release, Tom Hart Dyke has returned to the jungle. If I can find a species of orchids, it's as good as this, but new, or better. It really is worth risking everything to see these beautiful flowers. It really is good. What could possess a man to risk his life for a flower? Orchid Hunter, up next on Nova. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the Park Foundation, dedicated to education and quality television. Science. It's given us the framework to help make wireless communications clear. Sprint is proud to support NOVA. This program is funded in part by the Northwestern Mutual Foundation. Some people already know, Northwestern Mutual can help plan for your children's education. Are you there yet? Northwestern Mutual Financial Network. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. A member of an eccentric community that dates back to the Victorian era, Tom Hart Dyke is an orchidophile, an orchid fanatic. For two years, he traveled the world hunting for orchids and then was captured by gorillas in Colombia and held hostage for nine months. Since his release, he spent almost all his time at orchid fairs and in the greenhouses on his family estate. I can hardly think of one time in my life when I've gone out to do one specific thing that hasn't in some way been related to plants. In fact, there hasn't been. I think about plants more than anything else. The downsides, obviously, to someone else is 
normal life it has to be things like the social side, like going out, um, nightclubs and, and, and whatever else and um, obtaining, acquiring a girlfriend. It's a constant night nightmare because there is a barrier. This obsession with orchids is not uncommon. In his 1939 book, The Orchid Hunters, Norman MacDonald wrote, when a man falls in love with orchids, he'll do anything to possess the one he wants. It's like chasing a green-eyed woman or taking cocaine. It's a sort of madness. Collecting orchids is a kind of love sickness. It, it is excruciating. And you can't ever feel that you've known every orchid that can be known, because there are so many. They are the largest family of plants on Earth, with over 25,000 species that come in all shapes and sizes. One species looks just like a German shepherd dog with its tongue sticking out. One species looks like an onion. One looks like an octopus. One looks like a human nose. One looks like the kind of fancy shoes that a king might wear. One looks like Mickey Mouse. One looks like a monkey. One looks dead. Most share a few key characteristics that distinguish them from other flowers. Orchids can only be cut symmetrically in one direction. They're called zygomorphic. Other flowers, like daisies, are symmetrical no matter how you slice it. Most plants get their nutrients and moisture from the soil in which they grow. But many orchids, hanging high on trees, get most everything they need from the sun the air, and rain. They're called epiphytes. One of the most unusual features of orchids is that their male and female reproductive parts are fused into a single structure called the column. Other flowers, like lilies, have separate male stamens surrounding a female pistil. But perhaps the thing that distinguishes orchids most is the passion they arouse in people. It's a passion that generates a $10 billion a year industry. Many people attend orchid fairs just to smell the flowers. But when an individual prize orchid can fetch up to $25,000, you can bet some people come to compete. Orchid judging began when the first orchid hunters brought exotic plants home to 19th century Victorian England. Since then, exacting standards have been set. Dorsal sepal wide, 1.2. Orchid judges, like these at the American Orchid Society, spend years in training. They've got to know the lineage of any individual contender and compare how it measures up against past award winners. Here, we're getting a little more ruffling on the edges of this. This awarded clone seems they to have a lip and talk. If you go to the oriental standard, you know, it's sort of polite that the petals are concealing the reproductive parts of the flower, and they, they, they actually grade that higher. And then tally the score. Judges, we've got scores that range, well, we have two at 76, one at 77, and Arlene is at a 70, 78. 78. Any orchid worthy of a prize has to be meticulously described. To begin with, uh, as far as our description, the obvious is that we have a plant with uh, two erect inflorescences with the flowers well held on the inflorescence. Petals creamy white, lip creamy white, crest, column, and anther cap pale lemon color. The winning orchid becomes the new orchid to beat. But win or lose, the fairs and contests incite the passion of orchid lovers everywhere. It's a passion called orchid fever. Tom, an amateur horticulturalist, has a bad case of it. He caught it growing up on his family estate, mainly from his grandmother. 
Now Tom's orchid fever and a burgeoning desire to pay tribute to his grandmother are about to combust into a dangerous mission. Tom's going back into the jungle to find a new species of orchid to name after her. One thing about it, she hasn't a clue about it. She, not a hint, no. I mentioned it. It'd be nice not to tell her until it's actually done. It'd be quite, it'd be quite nice, wouldn't it? If he's successful, his grandmother will join the ranks of many illustrious people. There was an official registry for orchids practically from the time Victorians began collecting them. And the tradition of naming them has continued even now. And there are orchids named after well-known people. There's a Richard Nixon orchid, a Jacqueline Onassis orchid, there's an Elizabeth Taylor orchid. There is a, I believe, a Barbara Bush orchid. And who knows, there might even be a Susan Orlean orchid. Finding a new species of orchid to name after Tom's grandmother is not going to be easy. Over the last 200 years, there aren't many places that orchid hunters haven't been. Uh, this is Dendrobium veratrifolium, which was collected by Mr. Hines in New Guinea in 1841. But Tom's research has come up with Papua New Guinea. At Kew Gardens, the world's oldest orchid conservatory, Jeff Wood, a leading authority on Southeast Asian orchids, agrees. Um, you have a vast range of ecological niches, ranging from the coastal mangrove in the south up to the central highlands. It's not an easy country to go and find orchids in because you make a wrong turning, you could end up as tomorrow's lunch. You know, there, there's still headhunters there. It's, it's, there's dangerous areas there. I know that it's got its political problems. I know there's a lot of guerrilla activity there. I know that the terrain is, ter is terrible and the, the diseases are, are, are rife, but that's why it's such a good place to go. If you want to find a new species of orchid, you've got to go to places that are dangerous because no one else goes there. Tom's mission takes him to Jayapura on the western half of New Guinea. Before he goes into the jungle, he needs to find a guide. And since orchids are protected under CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, Tom's guide will need a permit to collect orchids. In the wild, I hope Pac see. Agus works at the forestry <laughs> department and, like Tom, is mad ah, about orchids. Agus, many more things here. Top he look. suggests that they head to the Ballium Valley, a place renowned for wild orchids. But it must be said that a botanical party in that area was recently held hostage for four months, and two of their members were beheaded before the Indonesian army could rescue them. This is not a safe place. So Tom enlists the support of Hungarian-born anthropologist Cal Muller, who's lived on the island for the past 10 years. Still the easy point. Yeah. You got two days walking coming up. This is tiring enough, Cal. <laughs> Bum bruising stuff. And at the end of the day, I know my girl. I know I'll see, see some more kids at the end of it. <laughs> the grandmother of all our kids. That's sure, what they're after. That's right. The bigger, the better. Impress my grand. Come on. <laughs> Cal is taking them on a two-day march from where the road ends. There, they'll find the last settlement before undisturbed primary cloud forest. But once again, there's potential danger. The Danny tribesmen are headhunters, although the last reported incident was in 1974. Nevertheless, Tom is eager to hunt orchids and quickly gets out his books to see if Caillou, the chief's son, and the village elders can guide him. The basic problem is, since these are orchids which they see, but they don't really use, the flowers are kind of similar to them, they're very different to you, but they're similar to them. The Danny may be hunters, but hunting orchids isn't quite their game. 
They still agreed to take Tom deep into the jungle tomorrow. Orchid hunting hasn't really changed over the last 200 years, and orchid hunters haven't really changed. You have to be brave. You have to be somewhat foolish. You also have to be passionate and dedicated to finding something that, unlike diamond or gold or oil, it's not going to make you rich. It may not make you famous. Finding a rare orchid may get you, at best, a botanical footnote. The next morning, after breakfast, for the first time since he was released by the kidnappers 14 months ago, Tom is back in the jungle, hunting for orchids. One of the main reasons why we were released from Columbia is because I drove my captors completely around the bend. I was out of control. It didn't matter that they had lots of guns. Orchids were there. And, but once the commandant team gave the go-ahead for me just to collect on my own, game over. It was an orchid frenzy. The camp fell apart. At the end of it, they, they really wanted to get rid of us. They couldn't face another orchid again. Within a couple hours, Tom demonstrates the same behavior that drove his Colombian kidnappers crazy. Cal, <laughs> you see the orchid there, Cal? No. To the right of the fern. The fern's everywhere. That's the big fern. clump of fern here. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. There's a bloom coming down oh, there. Yeah, yeah, I got it, got it. Got it. Do you fancy coming along? No. We've got ropes and things. It's no. not too bad. No. Why Just not? Have a flower. You're crazy. <laughs> okay. I'm an old man. You're young. Go for it. Excellent. Good choice. I will. <laughs> no one on the rope from England or anywhere around the world has gone down that cliff race. I've got to go and risk it. Risk my life to go and get it. We love it. It is higher than, than obviously you think. <laughs> when you go over the edge and you look down there. <laughs> Incredible. Some dendrobiums here. Take a closer look. Unfortunately, even the water won't save me in the position I'm in. If I fall down, I'll hit a rock. You don't get bruised from this height. No chance. Oh, I've got it, I've got it, I've found it, I've found it. Right at the bottom of the branch, I've got it. I'm gonna check in and have a good sniff of it. I'm taking fragrance, fragrance check. There is no fragrance. There is no... Wait a minute, third fragrance check. Got moss check. Moss is covering mouth. And my blood's going to my head because I'm frigging upside down. But if I can find a species of orchids, it's as good as this. But new, or better, and new. Wow, we straight down that cliff face and straight down that waterfall. It really is worth risking everything to see these beautiful flowers. It really is good. Crazy thing to do, but. If you like flowers, I guess, if you're in love with flowers, maybe, but I wouldn't do it, not for a flower. But Tom would, for a flower named Dendrobium lausii, pretty with its hanging bell-like flowers and much sought after, but definitely not a new species. In risking his life, Tom carries on a noble tradition. In 1901, Eight orchid hunters went on an expedition to the Philippines. Within a month, one had been eaten by a tiger, another had been drenched with oil and burned alive, five vanished into thin air, and one managed to stay alive and walk out of the woods carrying 47,000 Phalaenopsis orchid plants. But if you're not inclined to risk your life, and you still want 47,000 orchid plants, 
it may be safer to make an expedition to your local warehouse superstore. Unlike the 1880s, when orchid collecting was the domain of the very wealthy, since the 1980s, the business of orchids has been transformed. Kerry Herndon doesn't just grow them. He mass produces them in his orchid factory in Homestead, Florida. A friend of mine calls this obscene. <laughs> There's just so many spectacular, beautiful orchids here. On every bench, there's 600 plants. The row is 100 benches long, so you've got 60,000 blooming plants in a row, 120,000 blooming plants in a bay, and there are 17 bays. That totals over 2 million blooming orchids. And then there's at least another 3 million orchids at different stages of growth. With more than 200 workers, an automated conveyor system, computer control climate, nearly a million and a half square feet of greenhouses covering an area of five city blocks, and more than five million plants, this is one of the largest orchid factories on Earth. The seeds of the modern orchid industry in America were planted at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. In the 1980s, when Dr. Robert Griesbach started doing genetic research on orchids, orchids didn't even rank 100 on the best-selling plant list. But by creating orchid strains that can survive the toughest conditions, like those found in the homes of negligent weekend gardeners, Orchids are now the number two best-selling plant in America. Number one is poinsettias. But unlike orchids, poinsettias usually end up in dumpsters the day after Christmas. One of the reasons that the orchids are seeing increases in sales is the consumer is looking at them as a good bargain. If we buy a poinsettia, and it only, only lasts several weeks. You can buy an orchid for the same price and it'll last several months. Science and industry have conspired to democratize the world of orchid collecting. 20 years ago, if you wanted to buy a blooming orchid, you were going to spend 35 to $75. Now we can deliver an orchid that's beautiful and healthy, and the retails start at $4.99. And Kerry could have sold Tom the dendrobium, for which he risked his life, for $25. But to an orchid hunter, it's not enough to just own a treasure trove of orchids. Gee, look at Cadetia, but look at them. One, two, three, four, yeah. five. The thrill is in the hunt. Huh? Yeah, 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 Agus, look. Oof. Just look at this bubble film here. And look at the, the pouch, like a pouch. Yeah. Tom's been up since dawn, trekking to the far side of the Danny tribe's hunting grounds. Especially higher up where the orchids are low down. They're going all over the ground. They're up the trees. Forget the trees. Look on the ground. They're falling over them. There, he immediately makes an important find. What do you think? Because look, look at the stems. The Could this be the orchid to name after his grandmother? Uh. New species. You think it's new species? Yeah. My grandmother. We yeah. want this for my grandmother. <laughs> yeah. OK. It's not... It's all right. It's not very big, but still, it'll do, sort of thing. It's not exactly an Elizabeth Taylor orchid, or even a Barbara Bush. I think it's a parlor cat, really, Andrew, to be honest. I hope we find something a bit bigger. Agus thinks that it's a member of the group or genus Bulbophyllum, but can't identify the species. Tom decides to bank this plant in case they find nothing more impressive. He takes a photograph and GPS reading, both vital for a formal identification. Later that night, he can't find the plant on his computer. Could this be a new species? Finding a new species of orchid is difficult but not impossible. But finding it is only half the battle. Being the first to publish and thus have the honor of naming it can be just as difficult. 
Recently, a new Phragmopedium was discovered in Peru. When it was brought into the Orchid ID Center at Selby Gardens in Sarasota, Florida, Wesley Higgins was ready for the race to begin. So this flower was so spectacular. We knew that there had to be others, you know, racing to get the name in the publication. First, they had to work fast, because the original frag had to be sent back to Peru under the terms of the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species. But as with any orchid that arrives at the ID center, Higgins enters its description into their database, while John Beckner checks the files. They could find nothing like this orchid. Higgins scrambled to put together a team of three experts to write a Latin description of the new Phragmopedium, while Beckner pressed a dried specimen. The only missing element for publication was a drawing of the new plant. The editor came into this room here and asked me, if can, can I do a color illustration? We need it desperately for tomorrow. And uh, I started work right away and uh, started to sketch the outline of the plant and whatever. And by 3 o'clock in the morning, it was done. And that was right time to stop because my eyes went crosswise. That same day, in a special supplement to Selby Garden Scientific Journal, the Phragmopedium was officially introduced to the world. The honor of naming it went to the man who brought it through the door, Mike Kovac. He requested that it be named after him, so it was given the name Phragmopedium Kovacii. This is the most spectacular, the most sensational, the most incredible looking orchid in a hundred years or more. This is an orchid hunter's dream. If Tom can find a new orchid as beautiful as Phragmopedium Kovacii, he will have found a tribute to his grandmother worthy of the Queen of England. He's anxious to get back out to the jungle, but Cal wants to give Tom a lesson in material anthropology. He's got the bigger flowers with more ready bases. He has discovered that the Danny used fibers from the Diplocolobium orchid to make nets for hunting. To the world outside the Danny tribe, there is one other orchid out of the 25,000 species that has some practical value. It's vanilla planifolia, and its seed pods produce the flavor vanilla. But Tom is only interested in the beauty of the flower, and his time to find a new species is running out. I go to Dendrobium. Yeah, yeah, Dendrobium. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is getting ridiculous. <laughs> there is just too much stuff. And we're getting it down to the genus. Um, Five, ten percent of it, I know what the species is. Oh, yeah, that's Cascadetia, yeah, that's right. And what is that? That's <laughs> not very good. New, new, yeah, new, new species. Yeah, new species. Maybe. Maybe not. It's deja vu all over again. Yeah, a new species. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Both Tom and Agus may be out of their depth. They're having difficulties with the genus and subgenus let alone being able to recognize the subtleties of species and subspecies. But then, Tom stumbles into a field that reignites his passion. And there, look, and there, look, and there, look, and there, and there, and there. This grassy glade is orchid heaven. Hey, what are we getting so excited about? Now, you've got to have a look at this. This is what it's about, Kel. This is the trip. This is why I'm here. Turn it around so I can see it. Paphiopetalum right. wilhelmini, right. a slipper orchid. Don't you just that, see that pouch? Do you really see nice. that slipper? All right, all right, all right. Do you see the twisted? If this doesn't give you orchid fever, nothing will. Behind every orchid's beauty lies one of the most seductive reproduction strategies on Earth. All flowers reproduce with the help of the birds and the bees, insects, and even wind. Conception takes place when pollen tubes, the flower equivalent of sperm, make contact with egg cells deep in the pistil. 
it's kind of a sloppy shotgun approach. Orchids, on the other hand, are more like smart bombs. They trick insects into picking up their pollen sacs by hiding them inside what is often their largest and most colorful petal. Insects are attracted to the flower by its color and by the spots and hairs on the lateral petals. They hone in on the center of the flower and immediately fall into this waxy, pouch-like petal known as the lip. The only way to escape this flower is to travel up the back side of the petal where there are hairs and to exit out of either side of the column where a small hole and a mass of pollen awaits the insect. The bee will then carry pollen on its back to another flower. On the other orchid's female sex organ, buried on the underside of the column, millions of pollen grains are precisely positioned to come into ultimate contact with tens of thousands of little orchid eggs. That's a lot of bang for the buck. To ensure reproductive success, an orchid comes up with amazing tactics, sometimes even deceiving an insect into believing that it too is an insect. You have some of these terrestrial orchids that are actually pollinated by the male insect of a species that mistakes the orchid flower for the female. And so, you know, in technical terms, they call it pseudocopulation. While the male wasp is at it, the orchid glues its pollen sac onto the insect's head. When the wasp is frustrated enough, it goes off to another orchid. And this time, the orchid grabs the pollen sac and conception is complete. At least for the orchid. But beyond just the visual mimicry, the orchid further attracts the male insect with a fragrance that smells like the female sex pheromone. Plus, the orchid blooms two weeks before any female insects are even hatched. The male insect has got basically an orchid or nothing. I mean, it's the ultimate playboy sex. It's amazing. The thing about orchids is they seem smart. They seem intelligent. And the way they get pollinated by tricking insects into thinking that they are actually the most beautiful insect in the world. Tricking an insect, that's extraordinary. And in a way, that's what orchids have done to human beings. From practically the beginning of time, they've managed to seduce people into looking for them, collecting them, caring for them, being absorbed by them. And that's sort of an extraordinary quality that you can't just chalk up to simple science. There's something there, something that maybe we really can't even understand. It's that special, undefinable quality that drives Tom to risk his life for an orchid, and may even infect cow with orchid fever. But that is a lovely flower, I must say. It is gorgeous. I, isn't I it? do admit it's to just, that. Yeah. I mean, it is a fantastic. Now I'm beginning specimen. to understand your orchid fever. Yeah, the virus is there. <laughs> is there? <laughs> Slowly, slowly. It's Tom's last day in the Ballium Valley. And with Cal successfully initiated into the orchid cult, he's fired up to find his grandmother something more than that tiny bulba film. He's taken Agus down to the river, and within seconds, they spot three unusual species. Very exciting, so many. But hiding away beneath an overhang, they find something really special. Flowers. Look at these flowers here. It's unique. It's got the flowers of a dendrobium and the, the, the features of a, a bulbophyllum. I mean, the leaves. Could this be the treasure that Tom has been seeking? An undiscovered cross between two different species of orchids? But hey, very interesting and quite exciting, I think, to do it. Flushed with success at their astonishing find, Tom decides to pay for a feast. He's leaving the valley tomorrow and wants to thank the villagers for all their work. It's a well-earned night of celebration. But tomorrow is the moment of truth. Let's see if this fat is good as you say. <laughs> your blood. When Tom returns to Jakarta, 
There he will consult the experts to learn if he has succeeded in finding a new species to bear his grandmother's name. Once in the city, Tom discovers he's almost back to square one. It's the same one. Yeah. The Dendrobium bulbophyllum yeah, yeah. hybrid is Dendrobium northophagicola. With better oh, reference no. books, he and Agus quickly find that what they thought was a new hybrid is actually a well-known species. Cheers, Mr. Reeve. Thank you very much. Next. And the other plant they found is, in Tom's opinion, unworthy of his grandmother's name. He's got to go back into the jungle. He's heading for the Van Rees Mountains, one of the last places in the world considered virgin territory. We need to go to a place where no botanist has ever been, where no one's is even documented a, a tree leaf. <laughs> Less than half of this island has been explored by Western scientists, and where they've gone, the finds have been astonishing. In the last 10 years, 25 new species of mammals, 16 new species of insect, and seven new species of frog have been found. Relatively speaking, Tom's chances are good. The nearest landing strip is a small missionary outpost on the edge of Lake Holmes. Having realized in the Ballium Valley that the combined knowledge of him and Agus just isn't comprehensive enough, Tom has brought in botanical big guns. Agustina Arabaya and her field assistant, Julius. They are Papua New Guinea's leading orchid experts. Ask them that we need really forest that has not been uh, cultivated before. Primary forest, yeah. so that would be the place to go. Yeah. After consulting where to go tomorrow, the downside of bringing in the professionals becomes clear. So, Agustina, what do you think of my collection here of an Oberonia species. How can you keep this specimen if you just fold them like that in, and it's not flat? But you see, all you have to do is put the, the specimen down here as flat as possible, put the loo on e either side, shut the book and clamp on lots of dictionaries and, that, and suitcases. Tom's toilet paper technique for pressing specimens isn't up to professional orchid collecting standards. You can't just tell that it's Oberonia. So normally I collect the specimen like this. It's all I had. It's clear that Tom, an amateur, is going to have to work hard to keep up with Agustina. With provisions for six days, the team heads off to the northern shore of the lake, to primary rainforest, an area where no botanist has ever gone before. For better or worse, this jungle with its insect sounds and flora is more reminiscent of the jungle where Tom was captured and held hostage on his orchid hunting expedition in Colombia. Look at this. On their first day in this new territory, everybody is excited about the astonishing range of orchids. You can see it now, yeah. It's lovely, isn't it? Small, but lovely brown lip. But Tom's strong desire to find a plant for his grandmother is beginning to rub up against a growing sense of competitiveness. And it's Agustina who scores first. And it's a different color, isn't it, as well? Yeah, the different, and different pattern color, yeah. of color. Tom isn't impressed. What Agustina has found is at best a subspecies of Dendrobium orchid 
and dendrobiums are the second most common genus on the island. Competition aside, Agustina's presence does ensure that the team has a much better chance of collecting plants that have never been discovered. And since the database doesn't contain the dendrobium that she collected today, it may be Agustina who gets an orchid named after her first. You're getting excited about Agustina's dendrobium. <laughs> Orchids are known to excite. The English Herbal Guide in 1653 advised discretion. Orchids are hot and moist in operation, under the dominion of Venus, and provoke lust exceedingly. The name orchid derives from the Latin orcus, which means testicle. Orchids aren't just pretty, and a lot of them aren't even pretty at all, but they are sexy. And it's really one of the things that makes them unusual among flowers. It was believed that orchids sprang up wherever animals had been mating. And in Victorian England, women weren't allowed to have orchids because the form of them was thought to be too erotic and too sexual, and it would be too much for a woman to, to bear having a flower that sexual in her possession. Agustina, The next morning, Tom is first to score. Agustina. Yeah, I can see. It's, it's that podium, yeah? You excited, I guess? <laughs> I'm really excited. It's kind of weird. We have to decide who goes and gets it. You. Well, there's no one else, is there? These guys are all having fun. Vine, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. Grab it. Or we can... Agustina goads Tom to climb a 35-foot tall tree. With Tom safely back down on the ground, Agustina and Julius get out the books, and the news is good. This is a new species because, have a look at this book, white... Agustina is confident that there are enough differences between the well-documented Dipodium pictum and the plant that Tom has found to make it worth collecting. All the odds against us produce the goods. This is what I'm talking about, though. This is my great... Look, it's got grandmother. Look at it. G starts there, the R there, and perhaps the ND in the middle. Tom can't contain his one-upsmanship. But that night, he's tortured by doubts that his find is just a subspecies. And to make matters worse, he's getting sidetracked by his desire to outperform Agostina. The biggest illogical plant I've ever seen is the classic species. Augustina. At the angle. It's not going to come, is it? No, I just, this fine. It's just. The match. Make a match. This isn't even my, this isn't even my stamping ground. It's a backyard. There's nothing new about this large flower, spotted 70 feet in the air. It's just that a few days ago, Agostina firmly asserted that Tom would never see a selagony orchid flowering this time of year. Tom's rubbing it in. Ah, yeah, I see it. You see it, huh? Yeah. Seems to be in season all of a sudden, doesn't it? Mm hmm Like now. Yep. Three days ago, it was out of season. But, but yeah. I can't climb it. It's fine, I'll climb it. Well, no, you won't climb it, can you? <laughs> I don't think I'll even bother, but I know a man who can. Bug. 
is just... I Don't mean, worry. that tree is so straight and slippery. Can you do it? No chance. If he can manage. Tom knows it's a Selogeny aspirata, already a described species. But he gets the satisfaction of proving Agostina wrong. <laughs> With only two days of food left, and still no definite plant to name for Tom's grandmother, personal obsession seems to be getting in the way, just as with the Victorian expeditions. It's shocking to see what people have done to compete to be the one person who has an unusual orchid. In Victorian England, when orchid hunters would go out, if they would hear that another hunter was following in their path, they would take not just every single orchid they could find, they would sometimes set the place on fire. So the hunter following them would come upon a moonscape that had been burned to the ground. In some instances, there were stories of hunters urinating on each other's um, shipments as they were going back to England to make sure that the plants died. There were murders. There were probably more murders than we even know about of unknown orchid hunters who just never came back. Tension is high among the orchid hunters. There's a growing sense of urgency to cover more ground. <laughs> then, three hours from camp, Agus makes what may be the find of the trip. Good. What do you see here? You sure it's orchid? Yeah. Augustina. Hold on. You're right. This is orchid. And how are you telling it's the orchid? That's the labellum. That's the Guinness. So you've got the column at the back there going yeah, down, yeah. and you've got okay, the labellum. I'll open one of the problem but is, what's next? I have no idea about the Guinness. Guys, 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 guys! <laughs> <laughs> We're hopeless! This yeah. is the first time, this trip, and the first time I've been with you, that we've never been able to try the genus. Bets. It's a plant to baffle the professionals. Agostina agrees it's a member of the orchid family, but has no idea what species it is, and doesn't even have a clue what genus or group of species it's from. And the bargain is, as Julius pointed out, the extra bar bargain. The last time a whole new genus of orchid was discovered was more than a decade ago in Ecuador. So we have new species, sure, but, but new genus, something else. Unknown genus. <laughs> Unknown genus. I would say unknown Those two genus. words, it's like church bells on Sunday, half past ten, unknown genus. The team is in a situation that most botanists can only dream of. This is why we come here. This is why we're in an unexplored area to find unexplored things. Mm -hmm. But not just record them for the first time in this area, to record them for the first time. Full stop. First time. First time boys, not just species, not just species, but genus. <laughs> I, I don't see how you could get too much better than this. For a few moments, the orchid commands the hunter's reverential silence. With such a potentially momentous find, Tom decides to quit while he's ahead. He's eager to get back to civilization and let the experts figure out if the plants he's found are all he hopes they will be. Amazingly, experts only recently discovered that orchids are among the oldest flowering plants on Earth. At the New York Botanical Gardens, 
Kenneth Cameron is extracting orchid DNA to trace their evolution back over a hundred million years. By mapping DNA sequences for individual orchids and then comparing thousands of samples, he's able to construct the entire orchid family tree. He's discovered that the oldest orchids originated at a time when the land masses of Earth formed a single supercontinent called Gondwana. As Gondwana split into the continents that exist today, orchids split with them and evolved into different species. And at 100 million years old, orchids predate the extinction of the dinosaurs. In fact, the very asteroid that killed off the dinosaurs may have caused the climactic conditions that enabled orchids to become the most abundant and varied family of flowering plants. Earth's biota, its entire ecosystems, its climates shifted, and this allowed the flowering plants to become the dominant plant form on Earth. They survived the dinosaurs, but will they survive the passion of the orchid hunter? It's two months after Tom's return, and Jeff Wood at Kew Gardens has been working on the samples Tom exported from Papua New Guinea. So Jeff, what, what do you think of the samples that were brought back? Are they in quite good, good condition, or...? Well, reasonably. <laughs> um, no, they're identifiable, certainly, most of them. And this is the huge disappointment. I can see, Jeff, that you've named it straight to a species. Yes. Um, we didn't know what The flower that there. commanded their awe is not a new genus, or even a new species. It's dismissed as common. Um, Tripidia acuminata, the genus itself, is quite widespread um, across the Pacific Islands. So Islands. it's wide, widespread all over? Yes, it's found in Borneo as well, not the oh, particular dear. species, but, but, but the genus, genus is quite is. widespread. And regrettably, the dendrobium that Agustina thought was going to bear her name was actually discovered by J.J. Smith when Papua New Guinea was still a Dutch colony. Luginium. Augustina will be, will be a bit upset the, about the, that. The, Dutch. the new species of dipodium is the well-described dipodium pandanum. The only plant that offers a ray of hope is the very first bulbophyllum that Tom found in the Ballium Valley. Um, I see there's not a species name there. No, because bulbophyllum, there's well over a thousand species of bulbophyllum. I um, think it's definitely a chance. Oh, the only contender that might bear his grandmother's name is the plant that Tom described as a pile of cack. But all those things I said about you, I really didn't mean it, Balba Films, but you're absolutely great. I've Thank been very um, rude to the, the, the plant. Um, I'll take you completely back. Um, I know it's a pile of cack in the past, but things have changed. When it's the best contender in town, things have got to change and quick. In fact, Tom's grandmother's nickname is Crack. So why not? Bulba Film, Crack, Cack. Do you, do you approve of that? Or <laughs> yes, do you think it's quite funny? <laughs> well, as long as I've got your approval, then that's yes, excellent. You certainly have. I feel well, much I better, better yes, about yes, it now, I, I think. I think it's wonderful. But even Crack's cack will not stand. Two days after this conversation, Jeff Wood from Kew Gardens called Tom to tell him that the plant is not new. It's called Bulbophyllum orbiculare. Learning that he has not found the holy grail of orchidophiles is certainly disappointing. But all is not lost for the orchid hunter. The bad news just gives him good reason to go back to the jungle. Bitten by the orchid bug? On NOVA's website, indulge your orchid obsession with a photo gallery of flowers from around the world at pbs.org or America Online keyword PBS. Educators and other educational institutions can order this or other NOVA programs for $19.95 plus shipping and handling. Call WGBH Boston Video at 1-800-255-9424.